Hey folks, welcome to another Triple T Thursday. For those just joining us, that's tools, tips, and talk, where we'll discuss info for the knife maker. Today's episode is a momentous occasion. It is Triple T number 100. Yes, folks, I've been doing this every week for almost two years. I haven't even skipped a week. So um, what better time to introduce a new series than today? So today we're gonna to be talking about my next series. So I did the beginner series. I just finished the intermediate series. So this next one is gonna be a Damascus pattern series. So we're gonna go deep into the different Damascus patterns, what you need to know, do's and don'ts, and how to be successful at those different Damascus patterns. So um, thanks for joining me, folks. Let's go down to the table and talk about preparation. Okay, so let's talk about Damascus. Again, we're talking about modern Damascus, not Woots. Woots, uh, for everyone, that's when you put things in a crucible and you mix them together and you let it melt and it creates a different kind of steel. That's not what we're doing. We're doing pattern welded, as some people call it, pattern welded Damascus, where we're gonna layer different kinds of, of steel to create a pattern. So first, let's talk about how to formulate our stack. What many of you may be used to is just alternating the stack, just different, two different kinds of steels, alternating them one after the other. So think of the white as um, our nickel steel and the, uh, the dark as our kind of our, our high etch steel. So typically this would be something like 1080, 1084, 1095. Those are the typical steels you're going to use for the black. Okay. The other steel is typically going to be something like 15 and 20. What 15 and 20 is for folks, 15 and 20 is just basically it's 1080 with 2% nickel, hence N20 is 2% nickel. So it's just 2% nickel added to 1080. The reason we use this combination is because they all have the same heat treat. So it's, they're almost the same steels. 1095 is just a bit more um, carbon. 1084 has a bit more manganese, but they're basically the same heat treat. That's why we use them together. You don't want to use a steel that has a different heat treat um, than say in place of 15 and 20 or one of these. Okay, so let's assume we're just gonna alternate our layers. This is how most basic Damascus is done. Your ladder, your raindrop, uh, your, some of your twist Damascus. Most Damascus will start just with alternating layers. Let's talk about thickness of those layers. So I will typically do either, and again, I'm going to do this in uh, Imperial Freedom Units, um, but I will put the metric equivalents uh, down in the corner. But when I talk, I'm going to talk in, in Imperial. So I would at least do eighth inch layers of these. Sometimes I will use 330 seconds. Um, so this is 0.1 two five inches and this is 0.0994 inches sometimes I will use this I will not go less than this the reason being is when you put this in the forge if the outer layer the top and the bottom are are thin when these start heating up they will bow and they will actually come up off the other layers so uh, you want these relatively thick now the other layers, the 15 and 20 layers, I will go as thin typically as I can get. So 0.049 inches, that is what, less than a 16th, um, is what I would typically use if I was just doing uh, a stack like this, like if I'm doing ladder Damascus or something like that. Sometimes you can't find this and you'll do the 0.065 inches, which is, um, 16th inch, okay, um, that's fine too. The reason you want this thin 
the thinner you make your layers to begin with, the, the more layers you get with the same amount of steel. If you start using quarter inch layers, your stack is going to be, you know, you, you got 12 layers, your stack is already three inches tall, right? So four inches tall, sorry, I didn't do that math right. Um, why would you go through that? No, wait, 12 divided by four? Yeah, three inches tall. Um, why go through all that? Why not start with as thin of the layers as you can so that you get more layers to begin with? Now, more advanced Damascus, you start varying these layers, and we'll get into that later. Well, we'll do things like having a really dark core in the center, then a strip, then maybe another dark line, Okay, and there's reasons why you would do different kind of patterns like this. When we get into explosions and other things, this is where you'll get into, especially mosaics, you'll get into different reasons why you just don't want alternating layers. Okay, so as far as how long, that's really personal preference. I like to do four inch uh, long pieces. And most of the stock that I use, I use 1.5 inch wide, okay, so my stock is roughly, whoops, roughly like this, okay, that's 1.5 inch wide, 4 inches long, and whatever the thickness is. The reason I use this, because I only like to weld, when I'm doing this stack, I only like to weld the ends, okay, because these ends you're always going to cut off, okay. I don't like to put weld beads here. So I stay away from making these longer. If you make these, if you make this six inches, these will much more have a tendency to bow, right? So you need to put a bead of weld down the side. The problem is sometimes you'll get that weld into your billet when you restack it. So that's why I personally like to stick with the four inch so that I just have to put beads of weld on the ends just to keep it all together. Let's talk about preparation. This is a really important part of Damascus because if you don't prepare the billet correctly, you're just not going to be successful. So the first thing is cut it to the same size. Meaning, don't have one piece that's an inch and a half and another one that's an inch and three quarters. Okay? You want them all the same width, you want them all the same length, um, otherwise you're just you're just giving yourself problems. You're going to increase the chances of cold shuts. Just make sure your, your stock is relatively the same size. At least kind of within a sixteenth of each other. Okay, preferably dead on. So cut them all to the same size. Next, grind off the mill scale. Okay, I usually put a 120 grit belt on. I use the surface grinder. Okay, you can just put them on your flat platen, whatever you want to do, just make sure you grind off the mill scale. There's just no excuse for not doing this. You'll have a much better forge weld if you have clean steel. Remember, this is grease, it's oxidation. Mill scale is just not good. You don't want to have that on your steel. Lastly, make sure it's clean, free of dust and oil. You could be handling it with your fingers that have grease on them. Um, just dust from being in the shop, just get it nice and clean. I will typically take some uh, acetone in a little bath and I'll wipe each piece before I stack it up. So the last step, we're gonna weld the edges. So like I said, if my stack looks like this, I like to weld here, 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 and here. Okay, not out here and I don't weld the corner. I like to weld here and here because you're always gonna cut these off. When you, when you um, draw your bar out, these are the pieces that always end up kind of round and funky. You're always going to cut those off anyway, so you don't need to worry about it. Again, if you're going to do six inch, if you're going to do longer billets, what I suggest is put a bead of weld down the side and then go to the grinder and grind off okay, that little hump. So it still seals all your layers, but you don't have that kind of that bead because what happens is as soon as you go to press the edges you're going to press that bead into your billet but if you grind it flat just the forge scale coming off will um, 
will typically just take that out and you're not gonna press that in. So if you are gonna put a bead down the side, go to the grinder and grind it flat. Okay, I'm also assuming that you're gonna be welding the edges. There's also a technique where you can cover it with sacrificial steel. Um, of course that works well. You don't have to worry about the forge weld. You don't have to worry about oxygen getting in and oxidizing. It just takes a lot longer. Um, for normal Damascus, I will typically um, not do that on my first weld. My first weld would be an open weld that I'm just going to weld the, down the, the corners, and that's it. Um, later on, when we get to more complex Damascus, that's when we'll come in and use the sacrificial steel, because then you're at whatever, the nth stage, could be the fourth, fifth, seventh uh, forge welding session, that's when you don't want to screw up. But in the first one, uh, I'm usually okay just uh, welding the corners and you doing an open weld. Are you guys looking for steel to make your Damascus? There's no better place than Maritime Knife Supply. They even have steel by the foot for the purpose of cutting it down because you can request it cut to specific pieces at no extra charge. That's great. That step I said about cutting it down to size, you don't even have to do it. You can have Lawrence do it for you. So that's a great option. You can shop and buy in US dollars, even though it's a Canadian site. And shipping is super quick. So check out Maritime Knife Supply for the steel that you need for Damascus. So our prep is over. We've got our billet all ready, all welded up, ready to go in the forge. So let's talk about the forge a little bit, some aspects of that, and then two flux or not two flux. So first the forge. Um, I'm assuming you have a forge that will get up to forge welding temperatures. Okay, you need to ensure that. I would make sure you know how to forge weld before you jump into Damascus. Take two pieces of mild steel, put them in the forge, or, or sorry, tack weld them together, put them in the forge, and just practice forge welding. Make sure that your forge can get up to forge welding temperatures. Uh, I always like to say, put some flux on it, put it in the forge, when you pull it out, it should be almost white hot and you should see the flux steaming off of it, kind of smoking off of it. Uh, and it'll be very apparent. You will know what I'm talking about when you see it. Uh, it will be very hot. If you don't see the flux smoking off of it, it's not hot enough. Okay, put it back in um, and crank it up. If you have, uh, just a note on forges, if you have a Venturi forge or um, some forges where you cannot control the air, that, those can be problematic because, uh, especially these frosty tea burners, uh, where all of the air, it just sucks in as much air as it can. The problem is you have a very um, high, uh, you have a high oxygen burning environment which means it's gonna oxidize quickly because you're sucking in so much air. That's not good for forge welding. You're, good, you're building up a lot of oxidation in the forge. You're, you're drawing in a lot of air. Um, it's much better to have a fuel-rich environment where you have a lot of fuel and there's not a lot of air. So it's burning. You can see the flames are coming out of the forge uh, on either side by about four inches at least then you know you have a fuel-rich environment um, and you're, you're not getting as much air in the mixture. Okay, that's going to help you with your forge welds. And you'll notice if you have a lot of problems with forge welding, it may be your forge and your mixture of gas versus air. So be conscious of that. So let's talk about flux and things to help the forge weld. So the first thing that I use Again, both these things are controversial. I will tell you my process. Uh, I use kerosene, so I will dip the billet in kerosene, only the first time, uh, soak it even in kerosene before it goes into the forge the first time. The theory with that, because many people ask me this, why do I do that? The theory is that when that billet goes into the forge, okay, that kerosene is immediately gonna burn off. There'll be a lot of flames, so be careful. Um, it will, there will be a lot of flames. The theory is that as the kerosene burns off, it's creating a low oxygen environment because again, you're introducing more gas, more fuel. So between the layers, it's burning off the kerosene between those layers 
and should be burning off all the oxygen and the air between those layers. It also leaves a residue on the steel that is supposed to help prevent scale. And scale is your enemy when you're forge welding because scale will prevent steel from forge welding together. So use it or don't use it, that's the theory. Uh, it works for me, so I continue to do it. Some people, uh, I know Salem Straub and others, will actually just dip it in their quench tank, uh, but any kind of oil, any kind of fluorocarbon, uh, WD-40, same concept. Um, you're putting, you're introducing a fuel onto the, the billet that it's gonna burn off as soon as it goes into the forge. Okay, so next is flux, okay? And again, kerosene does not replace flux. It's a totally different thing. Flux, typically borax, uh, is used to prevent scale formation and it will actually take scale off of your billet. When do I use flux? I only use flux during the forge welding period. So for me that's always three heats. I do three heats, three light presses in the press, and we'll talk about that when we get into it. I will do that, those are the only times that I will use flux. Okay, I will let the billet heat up first to a dull red, then I will bring it out of the forge, sprinkle it, and I only sprinkle the, the seams, not the flat parts, right? Just the seams with, with flux, and then I'll put it back in, and that will melt and seep into the seams, and that will prevent scale from forming, and the other nice thing, like I said, is when you have flux on your billet and you, you get it up to forge welding temperatures, you'll know because it'll start to smoke as soon as you bring it out of the forge. So for me, that's, that's a good indication. And even times when I'm forge welding and I have like TIG welded the seam so I know it's an O2, I'll, sometimes I'll even sprinkle a little bit of flux in part of the billet just so I, I see that part smoke and I, that for me is a mental, I know it's at the right temperature. Uh, some people say you don't need flux, and flux is an inhibitor. I don't agree it's an inhibitor, but if you have your forge dialed in perfectly, yes, um, you can certainly forge weld without flux. People did it for years. Uh, for many years back, uh, back in history, they, they didn't always have flux or have the flux that we have today. So yes, it's certainly possible. Um, I think it does, personally, I think it does aid you um, in the process, so I continue to use flux. But again, once I've got that billet forge welded, there's no reason to keep using flux once you've got that forge weld. Flux, borax, will eat the inside of your forge. Um, especially if you've got a, a KO lined forge, it'll eat through that stuff in no time. So always recommended have hard fire bricks on the bottom of your forge that you can replace if you're going to be doing forge welding. All right, so this point in the video, we are going to get into watching my buddy Jared forge his stack of Damascus, and we'll talk through some of those steps. We're not going to get through the whole thing, but we're going to talk about the process that he used when we started doing this. So we'll take it through the forge welding process, and then we'll get into the next video. So this is Jared's stack of 23 layers. Uh, it's coming out of the forge really hot. You can see the flux smoking off it. And now we're just going to give it a couple light presses for our first forge weld. So this is our second heat. You can see again it's super hot. Trying to just do some even presses just to make sure we don't get too aggressive. We're just trying to compress the layers here. Here we are on our final forge welding heat. It should be a nice solid billet after this. I'm giving Jared some pointers as he's doing this so you can hear some noise in the background. Now that the billet is forge welded, 
Jared's free to forge it on the edge or just draw it out, and that's what we do. But we'll cover that in the next video. We're going to end this video here. Jared's actually making a mosaic Damascus, which we may use parts of that in a future video. But for now, we're going to talk about something a little more basic, probably do a ladder pattern. So now that we've got this billet forge welded, drawn out a little bit, we're going to talk about the next phase and restacking. So we'll cover that in the next video and we'll get into ladder pattern. Thanks folks. We'll see you on the next one.